go ahead and start our session here today on the art of Advent with a brief opening prayer. And if you are a subscriber to Forward Day by Day, you may recognize a part of this prayer because I'm not too proud to borrow things and appropriate things when necessary. So if you would just bow with me. Holy Father, great creator, open wide the eyes of our souls so that we may see good in all things. Grant us this day some new vision of your truth and inspire us with gladness so that we may best serve you. We ask this in the name of your son, who is the center of this great season. Amen. All right, so today we're going back to our idea of awakening our senses and trying to inspire our spiritual growth uh, during this Advent season, which is the first season of the Christian year. So again, happy new Christian year to all of us. Today, we are going to focus on somebody who is so central to the story of Advent, our patron saint, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Last week, Tom did such a great job with John the Baptist, who also plays a huge role in the Advent story in the gospel readings of this season. John is the precursor. He is the announcer preparing the way for the entry of Jesus, the Messiah, into this world. And of course, the way Jesus gets into this world is through his mother, Mary. So we're basically going to look at three key aspects of Mary's experience during Advent before Jesus is born. And each of these is a very, very widely used theme in art of all ages. It was wonderful to go online and just see how many different works on each of these themes were available from all kinds of uh, time periods, you know, from the medieval all the way up to the very, very contemporary. So I hope you will enjoy this look and participate with me in, in looking at these wonderful artworks on the subject of Mary. So we're going to start with the gospel story. Almost everything we get about Mary and the birth of Jesus comes from Luke. So we're going all the way back to chapter one of Luke, and we're going to look at this gospel passage. Uh, and my moderator will click to the next slide. Moderator. There we go. Uh, we're going to hear about the Annunciation, which is really one of the most famous of all of our uh, stories about Mary. So I'll just read this passage so familiar to all of us, but so good to hear it again. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be? since I am a virgin. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth is in her old age 
and she has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. What an amazing story. And I think what comes out of this story for many artists is Mary's humility and acceptance. Her acceptance of the angel's proclamation to her stands in stark contrast to what Tom told us about last week, which was Elizabeth's husband. The angel Gabriel came not to Elizabeth, that's interesting, but to her husband, Zechariah, a priest of the temple, and said, you know, you, you are going to bear a son. God will allow your wife to conceive. And Zacharias kind of laughed and questioned that. Mary accepts what Luke says and says, let it be with me as you have explained. So a lot of the art about Mary shows this incredibly uh, humble, accepting feeling. So let's look at a couple of pieces and uh, my moderator is going to, or my technical wizard, Sandra is gonna click to a medieval piece now. Sandra, we're ready for the next slide. Uh, not getting that next slide. Uh, Tom, can you hear me? Sandra, can you hear? I can hear you for some reason. Okay, let's try that again. Whoops. Okay, for some reason, there we go. It's the one with all the gold. Yes, the medieval piece. It's two slides for, there we go. This is an Annunciation by an Italian artist, Simone Martini, and it shows, uh, it's in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. I think it's a really interesting, other parts of this altarpiece have other saints in it, but this is the focal point. We see Mary and we see the angel Gabriel. Um, what do we notice? Let's play the I spy with my little eye game the one that my grandkids love. I spy with my little eye a difference in color. Can anybody listening, can you chime in and let us know what you're seeing in terms of color in this painting? I'm looking to see if any of my participants. Mary has her blue on. Yes, she stands out. The rest of this has so much gold. The background is gold. The angel Gabriel is gold and white, but Mary has this dark blue robe and most pictures of Mary, not all, but most of her show her in her blue robe. And the explanation I came across was that she is often associated with heaven. In the Catholic tradition, she's called the queen of heaven. And the blue color is to remind us uh, of heaven and, and her, her uh, unique, connection with heaven. Uh, I think this is interesting because who is in the subordinate posture in this picture? The Anybody angel. out there? Who is actually kneeling to whom? The angel Gabriel. That's right. The angel Gabriel is kneeling to, and Mary is sitting. She is often depicted this is a part of Mary iconography is the word for it. She is very, very often depicted with a book or it might be open on her lap. It might be on a lectern near her. Here you see her left hand is on a book. Uh, so she, the idea is that she has been studying. She's been reading. She's devout. And also the word that we find in scripture that's used so often is that Mary pondered. Mary pondered what the angel says. And then later on in the Christmas story in the nativity, as you remember, after the shepherds leave, Mary pondered all these things in her heart. So to ponder, to, to be thoughtful, meditative, to go inward. I think that book that's associated with her, 
shows the contemplative side of her nature. So the angel is leaning in. And do you notice in terms of posture, she is sort of leaning back in, in either fear, perhaps she is overawed, or just a sense of humility uh, that she's often shown in a posture that, that is sort of, you know, sort of caving in from the middle in a way, not sitting up straight. Uh, also part of the iconography, we see in the center of this, a vase that has lilies of the valley. Now, I'm a master gardener of Pitt County, but I haven't done any research on this. I don't think lilies of the valley grow near Nazareth. Yeah, I might be wrong about that. Um, but we often see these. Does anybody have a guess as to why lilies, white lilies, would be associated with Mary? Anybody want to take a shot at that one? Her purity, because she was a virgin. That is exactly it. It is a symbol of her virginity. Uh, and you will often see them. Sometimes the, the lilies are floating off in the distance. Sometimes they're in a vase or container as they are here. The angel Gabriel, in addition to his halo, notice that he has like a, a branch, a wreath of olive leaves, I guess they are. And he's carrying an olive branch. This is the sign of peace. So peace to you, Mary. Do not fear those wonderful words. I am coming you know, to you in a spirit of peace. And way up at the top of the pointed arch in the center, that odd and wonderful figure, if you can zoom in close, is it's a, like a cluster of angels that are accompanying this, this announcement to Mary. Now, I want to contrast that. Thank you for going forward. Great job, Sandra. This, this is actually our stained glass of Mary in our church. Does anybody remember where, in terms of position, where, which window has the story of Mary in the nativity? Does anybody remember? It's actually front transept that faces the west. And if you look at the opposite transept that faces the east, you get the crucifixion and resurrection. And I have always thought it is so remarkable that whoever designed this church and did these windows, when the sun is going down in the west, the end of the day, night is coming on, we get the story in the stained glass of Mary's conception and the birth of Jesus. Beautiful, hopeful things. And when the sun is rising in the east, which is what you would normally associate with a birth and everything, that is a new day, a new dawn. That is the window that shows the crucifixion and resurrection. So the architects of this church and the stained glass designers are saying to us, the members of St. Mary's, that when dark is coming on, there is hope in Mary and the birth of Jesus. And when the day, the new day dawns, the new day, the freshest part of the day is really with the, the ascension of Jesus, his resurrection, new life for us. So I've always loved that about these windows. And when you come to church during a regular church service, it's this window, this set in the, that are not as illuminated as the ones with the resurrection. So the difference here, what is the big difference in terms of posture? And I only did this close up here. Somebody's kneeling in this picture. Who is it? Who's kneeling? Listening for my participants here. Mary. Yes, Mary is kneeling and the angel is standing above her. That is like a total reversal of what we just saw. The angel Gabriel is carrying a lily in his hand, which he holds over her, as we can see. She is already emanating holiness because she has that halo. His halo is purple and hers is gold. Maybe there 
TCU fans. That might be it, or LSU fans. But I can think of some other symbolic reasons why Gabriel might have a purple halo. Does anybody have a sense of that? Rather than just make them both gold, which would have been easy enough to do. What we associate purple with, does anybody know? I've heard before purple was associated with wealth back then. I don't know if that wealth has anything to do with it or like yeah, royalty. There in some like in medieval England, it was you weren't allowed to wear purple unless you were royal or connected to the royal family. And you're right, Ridge. The reason was because purple dye was so expensive, only royal people could afford it. And I would think, you know, Gabriel is one of the most high of the angels. So I think that that's kind of showing his power and authority. Uh, and and her, her halo is gold. We do not see the typical Mary blue in this portrait on her. We do see it on the angel. I wonder if the artist was thinking like he is going to confer that heavenly connection to her and it just hasn't quite happened yet. I'm not sure. How about the faces in this stained glass? Do you, do you find them to be warm or cold? Like the expression on the faces, how do they make anybody feel? Well, they look pretty cold. In fact, the earlier one that you, the other one, the gold one, she looked, mad even in that picture uh, i agree and jessica if you have time later to look at that picture and you zoom in you will really see both the expression of the angel and mary are very almost disapproving in a way they are not smiling yeah. um and i think you see that a lot in medieval art the artists were not as concerned with showing the human side of people these two faces they because of the glass, they're not tinted with fleshly tones. Let's put it that way. They're kind of white glass. But the expressions seem much more gentle to me. Uh, 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 and, and particularly the angel, he's, he looks almost, it's all right, Mary. It's all going to be all right. Yeah, this one uh, looks a little warmer. You're right. Than the yeah, they look more human, to be sure. More, more like an expression that we would imagine someone having. And her reverence and acceptance as she looks up to him is it's just a really touching, to me, it's a very touching picture. But it is interesting that she is kneeling to him because you don't see that as often in other artworks. So that must have been a choice of this artist. All right, well, we're going to go forward through a bunch of different um, renditions. Both of these come from the 1400s. Um, one is by Fra Angelico and one is by Filippo Lippi. Uh, and I think they're very similar. Uh, in both of them, I, we have the blue with Mary and there is this sort of inner, she, it's almost like she is bowing and, and you know moving away from him slightly in a posture of humility. Uh, the one on the left, she's actually crossed her hands. We see that at St. Mary's when someone receives the blessing and she is receiving the blessing. And I love that the one on the left, if you zoom in really closely on your own, you'll see they're like little cartoon words coming out of the angel's mouth, making the announcement to her. So, uh, and, and both the angels are garbed in tones of red. And we see something coming through the sky on the right. What is coming really close to Mary suspended through the air? Does anybody see it? Do you see that dove, dove flying down? And if you look way, way up at the top above the angel, you see hands releasing the dove. So what do we associate the dove with? The Holy Spirit. Yes. So angels, uh, he first says to her, you are going to conceive and bear a son. All right. So Mary asks only one question. She says, well, how can this be? So this is a technical question. I mean, Mary's got a perfectly 
that's a perfectly legitimate question. How is this going to happen if I'm a virgin? So what he tells her is the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. This will be through the operation of the Holy Spirit. So here we see, I guess those are the hands of God or somebody releasing the Holy Spirit into Mary. My sense as I read this story in Luke is that the actual conception of the baby happened almost immediately after Gabriel's words. And I believe that's what's being shown here. Not that, okay, two weeks later, she received the Holy Spirit, but like it was right, either right then or in the moments afterwards. Does anybody have another take on that? Because very shortly afterwards, she's going to go visit Elizabeth. All right, we're going to move forward into some more modern pictures. This is from 1914. I think it shows a lot of influence of the late Victorian artists in England who were known as the Pre-Raphaelites. Uh, and this pick painting, which I think is just gorgeous, is suffused with a certain color. Look at the blues, the lilacs, the indigos. Uh, it's everywhere. Um, is it possible, Sandra, to zoom in on the angel using the zoom feature? Yeah, and it's, it should let you do that. And then you just move that block around and we might see. What do you think about this angel as compared to the others we have seen? For example, who do you think might have modeled for this? A female. Yes, this angel to me looks extremely female, and it's not just the hair, the hands, the posture, the neck. Uh, and that's interesting choice because you, even though angels are really, I guess, not, you know, gender in certain ways, it's unusual for an artist to present the angel Gabriel as a female form. And of course, the angel is holding forth the lilies as he speaks, as the angel, she speaks to Mary. And the angel's wings here are purple. The purple and the pink just run throughout this picture. If we go with that zoom feature, if we go to the right to see Mary, so I think there's what, yeah. Uh, what do you see in Mary's face? Um, what? How do you feel about this portrayal of Mary? She looks more surprised and unsure. She does look surprised. She looks in, incredibly young to me. The youth just comes there. And what, what makes you think she's kind of unsure? What gesture do you see that's... Her hand at her heart and her hand on her head. Her hand on her head, really, you know, it's almost the first time I looked at this very quickly. I was like, oh, she's scratching her head. Like, what? <laughs> I don't know that she's scratching her head, but that's a universal symbol of I am confused. Yeah, there is a sense of bewilderment and also the gesture of the hand to the heart suggests that she's really deeply moved by this. This is penetrating her inmost being. Who is this that's come to me and greets me with a flower, which is a very lovely gesture. So I think this is a very beautiful painting. The exterior, even though I think it was painted in either America or England, this exterior suggests a real Middle Eastern, you know, outside of a building. And almost invariably, a lot of these pictures show this happening either right in a doorway or slightly outside the building. Uh, let's move forward, Sandra, to the next. This one is one of my favorites. This is by an American artist named Henry Osawa Tanner. It was painted in the late 1880s. And I've got the, on the next slide, which we'll look at in a minute, tells you about Tanner's background. There is no blue here. Well, I guess there's a little bit way off in the shadows to the right. And Tanner had just returned from a visit to Egypt when he began this painting. 
he was very interested in showing Mary as a typical Middle Eastern person, not a not a blonde from you know Norway or something, which a lot of the Germanic medieval painters show Mary as being very light blonde and that sort of thing. Uh, here, the angel Gabriel is not depicted in any anthropomorphic or human type way. There's this shaft of incredible light. Uh, but I don't know how the artist got that quality of almost like flame, a white hot flame. And Mary, as she looks at this angel, that glow in her. But see, in her, can we zoom close to her face? <clears throat> Again, a very youthful Mary. Uh, I think that's one of the things that's most appealing about her as a character. She was very young. That posture, again, is almost deferential, uh, accepting that Mary is the great acceptor of God's will. And she looks up at the angel with humility, maybe wonder. Uh, her hands here, instead of being, you know, to her heart or held up, she is clasping her hands. What do we, does anybody have an idea about what that suggests? Prayerful, maybe? Prayerful, concerned. Uh, yeah, well. Right, right. And all the tones in this, if we can zoom back out, Sandra, it's just suffused with gold. <clears throat> yellow, tan, and red, red, red. So a very different color palette from what we usually see for Mary. The other thing I notice about this painting is all of the, the sinuous lines of the her dress, the drape of her dress, the drape of the sheets on the bed, even the carpet is slightly wrinkled. So there's all of this sort of complexity. And as you go up her figure towards her shoulders and her head, the fabric is far less wrinkled. So uh, to me, I, I know that's a deliberate choice the artist made. Uh, to me, it just suggests as you get, get closer to who she really is, that she's there's a more direct, all the wrinkles of her life sort of are sorry, straightening towards one, uh, single purpose to be the mother of God. Uh, so I, I think this is a lovely image and I believe it's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, you would never guess from this, but Mr. Tanner was an African-American artist. And can we go to the next slide? This just gives you a little bit. And actually his father was a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He specialized in religious subjects. He had traveled to the Holy Land, influenced by what he saw. Tanner created an unconventional image of the moment when the angel Gabriel announces to Mary that she will bear the Son of God. Mary is shown as an adolescent dressed in rumpled Middle Eastern peasant clothes. There's no halo here. There's no dove. There's no lily. None of those elements that are typical. Gabriel appears only as a shaft of light. Tanner entered this painting in the 1898 Paris Salon, after which it was bought for the Philadelphia Art Museum. So I, I, it's one of my favorites. Okay, so now I think we're going to turn to the next section of the story of Mary at Advent. And that is called, in the church calendar, it's called The Visitation. It's when Mary visits her cousin Elizabeth. So remember that the angel Gabriel said to Mary at the end of the previous passage in chapter one of Luke says that, and now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her. So Elizabeth is six months. She's at the end of her second trimester. And Mary has just conceived, recently conceived. So Mary is going to travel to Elizabeth and visit with her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, 
the child leaped in her womb. That's baby John the Baptist in utero, okay? The unborn John. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. So Elizabeth's reaction to Mary is instant and is a reaction of recognition. The unborn John recognizes the presence of Christ in Mary's womb. Elizabeth recognizes, why has the mother of my Lord come to me? Mary has not told her what the angel Gabriel said. As far as we can see in this story, Mary hasn't told her anything except hello. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, instantly John the Baptist and Elizabeth recognize something extraordinary in this. So this is a favorite subject of many, many artists. And we're gonna look at a few examples of that as we move along here. So Sandra, if you'll click to the next slide. Perfect. I just loved this. When I found this, I was like, I have got to have this in the presentation. This is a very early, it's a medieval sculpture by Master Heinrich of Constance. I don't know who that is. And it's done in wood and then there's gold and ivory. And the interesting thing, there are these two little glass lozenges in the, in the middle of each woman's stomach. There's a glass oval. And that obviously is supposed to represent their womb and something special in there. And I don't know if there actually was something in there. I couldn't find that out and I can't see anything. The real question here for me is, who is who in this picture? They look like twins. Elizabeth is not clearly defined by age or any other indicator. So who do you think, who would you pick to be the Mary figure? The one on the right. The one on the right looks like Mary. Why do you think that? I'm interested in that. I guess her face just looks a little younger. But, but then I look at the hair on the left and that kind of. Why is that womb thing where you were talking, the one on the right, it looks like it's white. And the one on the left looks like it's gold. Does it does. Happen? They do look different. Uh, actually, the the one on the left is supposed to be Mary. I, I agree with you that gesture of the hand on the heart seems to be more like what would Mary do. But here, Mary is reaching out to Elizabeth. You see the left arm of Mary behind her. That's her arm going across to Elizabeth. They're shaking hands. It's almost like she's reaching out to Elizabeth and Elizabeth is her gesture there I think is goes with those words and who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me oh I am overpowered with emotion that you the mother of our Messiah our Lord will you know because in the story even though Elizabeth is older how do I know she's older because she was barren I mean obviously she and Zechariah must have been trying for a while and Mary is supposed never been married. She would probably be in her teens. Even though Elizabeth is older, she shows all the deference in the gospel story to Mary because Mary is now carrying our Lord Jesus. So I, I agree with you, Jessica, that there is some difference in the tone of those glass lozenges. And I don't know whether that's a result of a choice the artist made or whether it um, just like the material he used was somewhat different. They are dressed identically, aren't they? Amazing. And they do almost look like twins. It's such a sweet moment. Uh, I think that's what attracts artists to it. And there is a true sense of sisterhood. We are two women. We have been granted the incredible gift of life by our Lord God and we are reaching out to each other. You know, why did Mary go visit Elizabeth? Yes, the angel told her Elizabeth had conceived by the power of God. And the next thing we know, Mary's on the road to visit. Um, 
you might ask yourself why I, I don't have the answer. I don't know that anybody does. Why it's there was something impelled her to reach out to her relative who was Maybe also she needed some camaraderie <laughs> with this uniqueness. I, I think, yeah, I think women do become closer in pregnancy with other women. Yes. And they both, she felt she had to go and they were, you know, I think there's a bonding there between them. It's also, as Tom pointed out last week, you know, it is the first time that John the Baptist and Jesus are in proximity and the next time they will meet will be at the baptism of Jesus. So we'll move on to the next piece because I have a lot of pieces. I don't want to run out of time here. These two are both from, one's from the 1440s and one is from the late 1800s. Again, Mary has her classic blue in both cases. What do you see that's similar about the Elizabeth figures? So they have are elderly in this depiction to me. I don't know if that. I think you're right, Rich, and particularly the hairdress really emphasizes that. In the in the Jacobs picture on the right, if you you can get close and see, she's got a really wrinkled face. I mean, she looks like me in the morning. She really, I mean, you she's very aged. How old was Elizabeth? We, there's not. She's clearly older than Mary but she could have been just in her 30s. This is not a 30 year old woman, not even in the Middle East. Uh, but the binding of the hair under these head garments indicates a more of a, 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 an older maternal woman. And Mary looks so much younger. I love the fact that in this picture, both Mary and, and the Elizabeth, these are ordinary people there's nothing extraordinary this not in their face not like we picked the prettiest girl in town to be Mary at all they just ordinary and then the same and, and in both cases Elizabeth is reaching out to Mary her posture is one of you know I let, let me greet you let me reach out to you uh in sisterhood so, uh, and the unbound here on the left, the fact that Mary's here is loose in the 1400s and hanging down like that shows her youth. That would be associated with a young woman. Once you were married, you started binding your hair up and covering it with wimples and hoods and all kinds of interesting devices. So she clearly seems so young and innocent in that picture. All right, we'll move on for just a minute. Um, what a striking image from the artist M, I couldn't find the first name, M. McGrath. Elizabeth greets Mary. There are words in the gold panel on the left, and I tried zooming in. I tried everything. I looked at 14 different versions of the same picture, and I never could get the words. I, they're just, I'm sure if you see the painting up close in real life, and I will say this. All of these paintings, as wonderful as they are online, in a book or in your PowerPoint, there is no substitute for seeing a painting in real life. It, it is so much deeper. I'm sure those words are, you know, you can read them in the actual painting. I just couldn't get the photograph to show. It says something like, this is something. And I couldn't figure it out. But I see the here you can clearly, again, tell... Okay, great. If somebody can change, I'd love to know what it says. And it, it's almost like a kidnap note. You know, it's like the letters are spilling out. Yeah, I see the word this at the beginning. This or his, I can't tell. I do see delight and rest, maybe. I, I don't know. But I just love that it's clear to me who is Elizabeth and who is Mary. Who do you think is Elizabeth? Anybody? On the right. And why, what are you seeing? What do you spy with your little eye that says this one is Elizabeth? She looks older to me, maybe. Yes, she, she looks, looks older. Pregnant too. <laughs> she great observation. Although in some of the medieval pictures, Mary looks just about as pregnant. And that wouldn't really, that wouldn't be, you know, like biologically the way it would work. But sometimes she's shown that way. 
I think the hair covering for Elizabeth is for an older woman and and uh, Mary's hair, even though it's not loose, is a younger, more open look. And all the light, there's so much light on the side of Mary. They both have halos, but what do you notice about the halos? And whose halo that? is br brighter and more golden? Mary's. Mary's. Right. And uh, the, the ribbons that come out of the back or whatever that reddish, orangish, pinkish design is, might be also suggest, again, that's the experience. We also associate that with tongues of flame, red, orange, you know, burning. Just really a human moment. They both are embracing each other. The joy in Elizabeth's face as she smiles into the same face of Mary. I love the African fabrics. Um, it just This is such a universal uh, story, really. Uh, two women enjoying the miracle of conception and pregnancy. And we'll click on to the next one, uh, Sandra. Thank you. This is by an artist named Isabella. It's either Ducrot or Ducrot. I don't know if she uses the French pronunciation. You can see the signature down at the bottom. And this is called the visitation. So what is what do you see here that makes this different from other things that we've looked at depicting this moment? Again, we don't have, you know, like doves and lilies and all of that typical symbolic element, but just the feeling of this, I'm not sure whether this was done in pastels or exactly what the medium is. The feeling you get from these, these figures are just kind of, they're kind of sketched, right? There's a sketchy element here. Uh, to me, it suggests it's this feeling of lightness and energy. There's a lot of energy in this picture. A lot of movement going on. Right. It's about the movement, the, the looseness of the um, media makes it um, more about the movement and the relationship of the two. Yes, I see that too. And the colors, it's just, to me, it's very beautiful. It's very airy and ethereal because instead of using those heavy oils and things, this, this is just a something that's almost a translucent uh, medium. And then I love the fact, the halos, it looks like my four-year-old granddaughter <laughs> drew them on there. <laughs> you know, they're not sophisticated halos. They're very simple. And again, the reaching out gesture. Each woman reaches to the other in a connection. This is their moment of, of greeting one another. And we do see a little bit of that Mary blue in Mary's mantle or her the cloak coming off of her head. And so that is a cloak and not wings, because I kept thinking, is that wings, like angel wings? Pretty sure. I'm not positive, but you see it goes on up through the halo, and, and Elizabeth also has some sort of head garment, you know, that's long, loose, like almost like a scarf or something. So that's why I think that it's shown. I can see where you might, and even that, you know, the back of her dress that's pink almost looks like a wing. It's like triangular. But it would be unusual to show Mary with wings at this point because she's not an angel. She hasn't ascended or anything. And that demure, her expression is just like three little lines. But again, that downcast eye, that, you know, sense of humility. Um, I just think it's a lovely, lovely piece. Uh, I didn't pick anything that I thought was ugly. Let's put it that way. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about, the last piece of the story of Mary and Elizabeth's visitation is the Magnificat. When Elizabeth says to her uh, that, you know, blessed be is she who believed that there would be fulfillment. Mary said, the next thing, Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. 
for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And this is known as the Magnificat. It, it moves from Mary herself. I have become an instrument of the Lord. I'm rejoicing. He has shown me great favor to moving out to the whole creation. He shows favor and mercy to those who are least and least powerful. And uh, he, he helps the poor and the needy as he has helped Israel. Uh, it's just a beautiful, I mean, it's a very, very beautiful speech. So if we click to a couple of paintings that relate to, a couple of artworks that relate to the Magnificat, here is that moment by a German, I'm assuming he's German with the name Franz Anton, Malbercht, whatever. Obviously, this is such a, I mean, Mary is so much the central figure here. As she looks heavenward, her her words are not really directed towards Elizabeth. This is this is a a, a a cry of the heart of thanks and recognition of God's power. In this painting, Elizabeth is shown. She is very old, isn't she? I mean, she looks like she is very well on in years. And there's some other women portrayed around in the background, which are not in the story of Elizabeth and Mary meeting. Uh, there are no other people around when they meet each other. Not that the gospel tells us. Anything about Mary that you see here that's different maybe from some of the other depictions of her? Uh, to me, she is everybody still there? I'm, I'm Pam, Callie, and Steve, if you have something, unmute for me. Anybody see anything? Um, yeah, we think that Mary looks much more, I don't know what, um, chubby? I agree. This Mary is a well-fed Mary. Uh, it, and I think the period of this piece is more like the 17 or 1800s, uh, Yes, she is filled with, you know, with with life and and power here, and very much more so when you contrast her with the Elizabeth looks uh, almost emaciated, to, in some respects. Um, so is that a way that they're showing the contrast of their ages, the roundness? I think, I think it definitely does heighten the contrast of their ages. It may be, I think it is an attempt to show Mary as a very powerful, full character, because I think the artist, you know, you can say that women back then were more, you know, rounded. The rounded look was much more fashionable and, and associated with beauty, but I'm sure the artist could have found a model who was not quite so uh, effulgent if he wanted to. He chose... And that would have been a sign of beauty back then, is a, a much fuller physique. I think he chose that because he wants to show Mary as beautiful. He wants to show her as filled. You know, she is filled at this moment. She is magnifying the Lord. And in her garments, there is a little bit more artfulness, the way that, you know, blue mantle, that blue cloak is tied in a little knot there. There's a little bit more that suggests, you know, an attempt to, to portray her as someone beautiful physically uh, than we've seen in some portraits. Um, so that's just an interesting one. I like the next one also. So Sandra's going to flip through for me to the Can next. Can I ask a question about this one real quick? Yeah. There seems to be a cross up in the upper left-hand corner. 
Yeah, but there is. Yeah, That's there is. Can we one. zoom in on that, Sandra? Above Elizabeth. Above Elizabeth. There's there's some mountains in the background here. Uh, you know, if it's if it's meant to be a part of the vine, the artist has drawn it so you can't help but see across. I wonder if he's trying to say, okay, like there were brambles and vines growing up this this cliff and let me just point out how important you know the cross is by making because there's also a cross piece down lower almost like a almost like a you know orthodox crucifix uh but i i don't know if he means that to be part of the vine stem and, and then he just makes it look like a cross as a symbol or whether he's like actually i can't really determine that you see what I'm saying? But undoubtedly, that cro the fact that it looks cross-like is deliberate on his part to suggest. Light around a little edge of it, I think. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's fine, but it's a subtle point, but great for seeing that. And this is, again, set outdoors. You know, there's this sort of cliff, and then there's an outdoor building behind Mary. And Mary's expression, very, uh, you know, filled with this, you know, what this reminds me of is that wonderful sculpture. There's a wonderful sculpture of St. Teresa of Avila and, and shows her vision of God. And she's got that same posture, like being overwhelmed by the power and beauty of God. So that's what we see in this. We should feel that joy. You know, we really should. Uh, when we think of God. All right, let's click on to, because we're getting towards the end here. We only have a few more minutes. I really like this picture, this painting. If you have a chance to look it up, just put James Tissot and just put, you know, like Elizabeth and Mary or Visitation and you'll get it. There was a version of this online that the colors were much brighter and when I tried to copy that one in, it just wouldn't copy on the PowerPoint, but this version of it would. So that's why I ended up with this one. Uh, here we see not just Elizabeth. Who else is in this picture? Have the older couple, Elizabeth and her husband. Remember his name? Zachariah. Yeah. And look how old they are. My goodness. And he, the different thing here is, to me, it's as if Mary is somehow apart from them. They are observing this. And she is in this ecstatic moment, almost of prayer, because her eyes are closed. Like the other painting, her hands and arms are lifting up. This would have been the traditional posture of prayer in the early church. We know that. In many praise and worship churches today, prefer this posture to the bowed head and clasped hands that is more traditional. Uh, Mary is garbed very much in a more Middle Eastern style than what we have seen. There's a lot of white associated with her and with her face, again, a sign of purity. And it's taking place outside. But Zachariah, if we could zoom in for a minute on Zachariah and Elizabeth. They seem, you know, like in awe or like drawing back in some way. Almost as if they're saying, what's she doing? Uh, and she is so much the focus, you almost don't notice them in the background. But they are very elderly and they, they there's more detachment. The, the Elizabeth figure is much more detached from Mary in these two paintings than in the, the ones that show the moment of the visitation. Any other comments about this painting? Again, this is, comes from the late 1800s, I think. Okay, well, if not, let's go. This is the last image I have today. And this one is really designed to make you think. It reminds me of Tom's opening image for John the Baptist. This is by a contemporary artist, Ben Wildflower. This shows Mary in the center. 
And we have words from her Magnificat, cast down the mighty, lift the lowly, fill the hungry, send the rich away. This is not really a traditional image at all. What is so strikingly different about Mary here? She's not calm and she looks powerful. <laughs> yes, she her gesture here is not the uplifted arms of reverence and prayer. It is the uplifted fist of power, power to the people. That, you know, this that's the classic 1960s sign for power to the people. And even her left arm, which is down by her side, look at the fist. She's got a clenched fist there. She stands in a figure, look what's under her foot. She is crushing death. We have the skull and the snake, the serpent, which I guess we're supposed to associate with Satan and sin, right? Does anybody else have any other interpretation for why there's a snake in this picture? A lot of times um, Mary is seen as the new Eve. Um, so that would be... Uh, oh, great observation. Center. Yeah, yes, you're right. Um, and of the old Eve, of course, was she was overpowered by the serpent, like she fell to the temptation. This new Eve, you know, by her acceptance of God's will and following God's will, she is, you know, crushing that temptation. That's great. Um, there's a circle of stars. Rather than the traditional halo, we have stars around Mary's head. Her face, she does not look like a happy person here exactly. Um, and of course it's black and white. I think it's like ink in the ink. Um, here's the interesting thing to me as an English teacher about this. I'm gonna look focus on the words a little bit more than on the image for a second. In the Magnificat, these words, cast down the mighty, lift the lowly, send the rich away, are in sentences that are written like declarative sentences. This is what happened. He has, God has cast down the mighty. God has sent the rich away empty. God has filled the hungry. In this particular icon or whatever it is, poster, these words have been transformed into the imperative voice. These are commands. Hey, you get out there and do it. Not God has done these things, but it's up to us to do these things. And I think that's a really interesting transformation. Not, not only is Mary in the Magnificat, one way to look at it is in the Magnificat, Mary is speaking gratitude and wonder at all the good things God has done. In this picture, Mary is saying, and now you guys, you people go out, you are God's people. You go out and do these things as God has done them. You know, in the real world, cast down the mighty, send the rich away. So a, a very revolutionary view a contemporary view of Mary there, but one that gets us thinking to be sure about her story. Does anybody have more to share with us? Because that is the end of my uh, presentation about Mary for Advent. Yeah, I was just thinking about like, how in the Catholic tradition, it seems like the story of Mary b became rather preeminent. And I was just wondering, like, what what is it about the story that that like made it take on such a focus in the church? Like, is it just the focus on miracles and the fact that it was miraculous? Is it uh, total devotion and servitude to God is, you know, it's hard to ignore kind of the subtext of sexual morality or like women's role in the early church. And I guess I was wondering, like, what does that say about like the people like what were they, why were they adopting it as a preeminent part and like sort of like the traditional like depictions of Mary, like how, how much they contrast with this modern depiction and what does that say about us and what does it say about the original story? I don't know. 
Here's I think something. that's a great point. And I'm sure that I'm not sure the exact date of this image. It looks like something from the 60s or 70s. But that also was a time in America, well, worldwide, of fe feminism, you know, an emphasis on seeing women as more powerful in the secular world. And the medieval and Renaissance period, you, you, women are much more um, seen as passive. Uh, so there are all kinds of ways to look at Mary. You know, traditionally, she does seem passive and accepting, but there are other ways in which she becomes so powerful. I'm not sure, Ridge, exactly why. It's an interesting question. Psychologically, why did people starting in the earliest Middle Ages venerate Mary to the extent that they did? She becomes almost a co-equal as an intercessor. Um, and there's a really interesting, if you really want to go into it, there's an interesting essay by Henry Adams uh, called The Virgin and the Dynamo. I don't know if you've ever read it. Adams was writing in the 1800s, like maybe the 1860s, 1870s. And he talks in that essay a lot about the way in the Middle Ages people worshipped the Virgin Mary. Um, I think a lot of psychologists think, you know, Mary is a very approachable. She is human. When we look at Jesus as being both divine and human, she is the human part of him. She gives God humanity. That's why God sent Jesus into the world to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us. And it's through Mary that that happens. So maybe for people, it's easier to relate to the human figure than to God who is seen as powerful and somehow up in the sky where, you know, we can't reach him. And also, I think Mary as a feminine character, I, I mean, a people sort of it's easier to talk to your mom sometimes than to your dad. Maybe that's it, that she as a mother figure, uh, she certainly has been a figure of great comfort to worshipers for a thousands of years, 2000 years. Um, she is one that, you know, she seems to resonate with our humanity so that's the best i can do on that. it that's an interesting subject and i think a lot of people historians have tried to figure it out you know because mary does become in the catholic church particularly in the M middle ages and the renaissance the counter reformation she becomes really a figure of veneration is it Hello? somewhat related to the catholic church being such a patriarchal um hierarchy and it gave the women of the church somebody to relate to that was like them and somebody that had some power um that was feminine it, it might be that on the other hand it might be that patriarchal group we're holding up mary as an image because she does come off as passive in so much artwork and commentary and saying in a way to women so this is your job is to be passive and wait for things to happen to you instead of getting out there and making them happen yourself. I mean, there are two interpretations of that, Pam. It's particularly if you read the Dan Brown book, uh, which of course is not <laughs> great literature or philosophy or anything, but he does propose this idea in, um, I can't even remember, the Da Vinci Code, that, that the Catholic Church, uh, you know, ha really tried to hold women women's power within the church down and they held up mary as a figure yes pray to mary okay and she'll be up there in heaven for you but she's not actually out there doing stuff uh she's just accepting the spirit of god that was sort of their view i think uh it's it's a, it's it's really it's an interesting very interesting question I think. And the last slide that I put up there, I forgot I even had this. This is a poem by the American poet Denise Levertov about the about the, the these artworks and about the story. We know the scene, the room variously furnished, almost always a lectern, a book, always the tall lily, arrived on solemn grandeur of great wings, the angelic ambassador, standing or hovering, whom she acknowledges, a guest. But we are told of meek obedience. No one mentions courage. The engendering spirit did not enter her without consent. God waited. 
she was free to accept or to refuse choice integral to humanness. That should give you something to think about, particularly Pam, I think that goes to your question. This poet sees Mary's acceptance of God's will for her, her assenting and making a choice to accept as being a sign of, of courage. One of my Remarkable. favorite um, Howard Wash quotes is that salvation begins with Mary's yes. I oh, I love that. Salvation begins with Mary's yes. Yes. What a great idea. That yes was a yes of giving in to God. In that moment of giving in, that's where her power derives from. It's a paradox. But it's just so true. Like when we give in to God's will, we do become more powerful in, in, in our lives, I think. We become the channel for God's power. So, and her choice is integral to her humanness. That God gave us free choice. That is a part of the plan. So just a little poem to leave you with. And y'all have been great. I'm so glad that we could all get together this way. Uh, and I hope next week we're going to take on the character of Joseph. And he deserves his place too, because there's lots of interesting art about Joseph. Thank y'all for coming. And I'm going to jump off now. Have a great rest of the